Hey guys, welcome back. So today I brought home this 9,000 watt Gen Pro generator. It's about 25 years old and can produce 9,000 continuous watts. Its condition appears to be excellent and powering it is a 16 horse Briggs V-twin engine. So yeah, this is a very nice machine. Now this actually doesn't belong to me. A local subscriber tracked me down when it stopped making power. He said he was running it, it had no load on it, but it went under load. And that is never a good thing. That's usually a sign that there is an issue in the stator, but that's what we're gonna find out. So let me get this off the trailer. I wanna get it running before bringing it inside. Just make sure the engine is good. And in fact, it is not making any power. See if there's any gas in here. Yep, there is gas and it smells good. And to check the oil, to get the dipstick out, this piece actually has to be removed. So let's get that out of the way and make sure we have some oil. Yeah, there's plenty of oil and it looks clean. All right, let's give it a try. There is no fuel valve, so if we crank it, the pump should pick up the fuel. And I've got two lights connected, one on each leg, and we'll just turn the main circuit breaker on. We also have a meter here so we can see if there's any output. And there's an hour clock. We're only at 319 hours so yeah pretty young i mean an engine like this can easily last 2000. Confirmed. There's no output from this generator and the engine it sounds good but The carburetor was having issues. I did have to choke the engine to kind of get it to smooth out a bit You know, that's something I'm not gonna worry about right now I think the big issue here is the lack of power now I've had good luck with brushless generators. I've actually never had one with a bad stator or rotor My hope is we have a bad capacitor. So let's get this inside. We'll get things opened up find that capacitor and we'll test it. I want to start by getting this cover off. Just do a visual inspection, make sure I don't see anything burnt. A lot of times too, the capacitor is down here. Sometimes it's in the control panel and judging by the size of this control panel, there's a good chance it's in there. But we'll start down here. 
Now there are only two screws holding this cover on. They're on the side and you can't use a ratchet or a socket on it. You have to use a screwdriver. So that's the shortest one I have. And it looks like it's perfect. Oh, and the screw's already loose. Even better. And so is that one. Okay, it looks very nice in here. Uh, there doesn't actually seem to be a way to completely remove the cover without disconnecting the wires. And the wires, they are not meant to be disconnected from down here. But visually, the windings look to be great. I don't see any broken lacing, no burn marks. So yeah, things actually look pretty good down here. So I say we open up the control panel and test the stator from there. So to get this off, it looks like if you want to take the face off, it's just two screws on each side and that face panel should move forward. And if you want to get the whole box off, there's actually two bolts down under there and two more tucked away in there. It's very hard to see, so the tank and the heat shield would have to come off first. But I say we just pull the face plate off and that'll at least let us get a look inside. Everything looks really clean up here. The two main legs come in to the circuit breaker right there and then branch off. A couple leads go over here, which that is the voltmeter. And then we have one lead coming over here to the Y terminal. And the other lead, it looks like to the X terminal. And then things are jumpered over from there into these smaller fuses, which feed these other receptacles. So I would suspect that this is our issue right here. Looks like it's a 50 microfarad capacitor. So let's get this cap off, see if we can disconnect those wires and see what it tests at. It's nice that there's a cap on here. So there's no accidents and interesting, they actually soldered the capacitor on. So I'm not sure why they would do that. So that is a component that does tend to fail over time. Let's make sure it's discharged. And it is. So to test this, it really needs to be disconnected. And we seem to have plenty of wire here. So I think I'm just gonna snip these leads off. We can put some new ones on if we need to. And uh, yeah, let's, let's get this tested. And I can see already actually, there is a problem. That does not look normal, that spot right there. So the capacitor, without even testing it, I would say is the problem. All right, let's see where this capacitor is at. It should be 50 microfarad 
plus or minus, usually about 5%. In this case, it says 6%. So somewhere around 50. And we get an open. And that's what this meter does when it reaches its limit. I'm pretty sure this can only test up to 200 microfarads. So whatever this is, it's not 50, it's actually above 200. And just for comparison, I have this one, it's rated at 30 microfarad. And we're at 29.5. And here we actually have two capacitors. These are old and used, 20 microfarad each in parallel. So it should come in at about 40. and it comes in at 40. So yeah, this capacitor, it's bad. And you can see that right there. And the multimeter confirmed that. So that is an easy fix. We only need another one of these with a 50 microfarad rating of at least 370 volts or higher. The farad rating has to match exactly. And that should fix this. So I just placed an order on eBay for a new capacitor. It's exactly the same as the one that was pulled off there. And it was only about $30. So that'll be here in a few days. And while waiting for that, I think it makes sense to pull this carb apart because it wouldn't run without the engine choked quite a bit. This pre-filter probably needs to be replaced. It actually, it's not falling apart yet but it's getting to that point where I think it's gonna start biodegrading really soon. The filter though looks to be in very good shape. So to get the air box off, I think it's just these four bolts plus this one right here. And then the breather unplugs from underneath where it connects to the engine. I'm just gonna close the choke. So that way I hopefully won't lose one of these bolts down the intake. Want to be careful with this carb. They're quite expensive. I actually had to buy one of these once and that was about four or five years ago. It was about $250. And I can only imagine they're more expensive now. Back then they didn't have a clone as an option. They do now. I'm not sure if they're any good, but I do not want to find out. So this carburetor, technically you don't have to take it off if it's just a clogged pilot jet, and that's the way it's behaving. So if I remove these four bolts, I should be able to lift the top off. I'll have access to the pilot jet, the emulsion tube, and the bowl. So if it's not too bad, I might be able to clean it that way. Otherwise, it's more involved because I can't just pull the bolts to get the carb off. I actually have to pull the blower housing and the entire intake manifold, which is fine. But if it's not needed, I would rather leave good enough alone. So let's at least take a look inside and see if we can clean it up that way.
It actually looks pretty clean in here, considering. I mean, there's no fuel shut off, so most likely this carb has had fuel in it most of its life. You know, maybe there's a bit of debris down there. But all things considered, I'd say it's pretty good. Anyway, this is what I'm suspicious of right here. This is the pilot jet. So I'm going to get that out. We'll just go through it. Also, the emulsion tube was on the underside of the top I took off, so we'll make sure that is clean. And the main jet, you can kind of just see it right there. It's on the side. The way you would access it is removing the bolt on the side of the carburetor and cleaning it that way. And that, I don't think, is possible unless you actually remove the carburetor. So for now, I'm just going to clean this jet and the emulsion tube. We'll put it back together. We'll try it again. And if it runs well, we'll call it good. Otherwise, we're going back in and we have to tear the whole front of the engine off, meaning the blower housing and the intake manifold, to get total access to this carb. Doesn't fit. That is an odd size. So the closest one that fits is actually not a great fit. And there's a reasonable chance that, that could strip it out. Well, we'll try it. Yep, it's coming. Nope, that was not clogged. That may have been a little. Yeah, I would say that was clogged right on the bottom. And that that may have been enough to cause that surge. So, yeah, let's get this installed. I'll, I'll double check the emulsion too, but I think that looks pretty good. And we'll try this again. Yeah, there's actually no debris down there. It's a little discolored, maybe stained, but nothing that's loose.
All right, let's try it real quick. We'll see if we can turn the choke off. And that was it. Just a tiny little bit of debris in that pilot jet. And that's why the engine surged before. You know, this time I was able to turn the choke off right away and the engine ran well. So taking that shortcut, I think paid off. That carb was in pretty good shape and didn't need much attention. As far as the rest of the machine goes, it's equally in good shape. I mean, the battery is good. The oil was full and clean. So there's not a lot to do here other than wait for the capacitor. You know, that said, I am going to clean it up a bit, just get some of the dust off. And when the capacitor arrives, we'll get that installed and hopefully this thing will come to life. The new capacitor showed up today. So let's just have a look at it and make sure it's correct. And it seems to be 50 microfarad, 370 volts, same form factor. And it even comes with this cap and the wire leads soldered on just like the original. So let's see what this comes in at. It's plus or minus 6%, so anywhere between 47 and 53 microfarad is within spec. And in this case, we're at 47.1. So a little bit on the low side, but it is within spec. So it should be good to go. So I think the plan here is just to cut the wires short. I'm not gonna disconnect them down on the power head. There's no reason to do that. And then I'll take the new capacitor and take some length off of this, maybe nine inches or so. I'm just gonna leave some extra wire length here. It's not gonna hurt anything. And originally I was thinking of just removing these terminals, putting some connectors on that just slide on, but then we're gonna deal with a crimp connection and really a friction fit connection. Whereas if I just use a crimp on style connection, I'm eliminating one area of weakness.
You want to make sure all these wires get in there. You don't want any poking out the side. All right, let's give this a quick try. I've got the light plugged in and turned on on one of the outlets and the kilowatt on the other. Now, I'm not sure if those are tripped or not. So I guess the plan is to start it. Hopefully things come on. If not, we'll try resetting the GFCI outlets. Now, this doesn't have an AVR. So I would say best case scenario, if everything's tuned right, we're gonna be hopefully at 130 volts without a load. So let's give it a try. Well, what can I say? I think we have bigger issues here. The light, it was slow to come on. It came on at about full brightness and then it slowly dimmed out. So I shut it down to avoid any damage. Clearly there's a bigger issue going on here than just a bad capacitor. So hopefully we didn't blow the new one out. I'm gonna open up the control panel. We'll double check it, make sure it's okay. And I think we need to dig in, check the health of the stator, double check the wiring and see what is wrong with this generator. So I would find it pretty hard to believe that we have a bad capacitor and a totally separate problem. Not impossible. And this capacitor blew out. Looks like the same spot. Very interesting. Let's make sure it's discharged. And it is. So let's start by checking the excitation winding. Now, I don't know the specs on this generator and this one is larger than most I work on. Usually an excitation winding comes in at about 1.5 ohms, plus or minus about half an ohm. In this case, we're at 1.3. So that actually seems decent. I think what I need to do next here is to isolate the main windings coming up. So they're coming up and going right to the circuit breaker. And once I get them isolated, you know, we can do some more tests on leg one and leg two. We can check it to ground to make sure there's no connection and then just check between the different legs and make sure nothing is cross connected. Just gonna mark this leg with some blue tape. So it goes back in the same spot. And the voltmeter, it is wired to the 240. So the highest I saw the 240 get up to is about 120 volts before the power dropped off.
Leg one and leg two have been disconnected and the neutral, which should be the common point between the two. So if I test this between leg one and leg two, on most generators, this would be about one ohm. And we're at 0 0.4, 0 0.5, that's pretty low. It's 0.4 and this meter has a resistance of 0.1 in the lead. So we're actually a 0.3 ohms between leg one and leg two, which is pretty low. So that to me is a bit of a red flag. And then if I do between leg one and leg two, we should get roughly half that and we're not. 0 0.3, 0 0.4. 0 0.3, 0 0.4. So that is interesting. This should be double. Should be around 0.6 and now it is a little higher. So that is a little suspicious. Let's just check this to ground. And we do have a connection to ground. So that might be the problem right there. Just to be sure, I'm gonna disconnect the ground wire. You know, I assume this goes to the body ground, but it could be wrong. We'll just disconnect it to make sure. And sometimes it can also be a jumper. So let's check between ground and neutral. Now, if it's jumpered somewhere, we might get a connection. If we have a fault in the stator, we'll get a connection. And yeah, we're getting a connection. You know, we are isolated up here. We should not be getting a connection. So I think we need to pull the end cover off the stator just make sure there's nothing going on down there. So here are the two black wires coming from the control panel, leg one and leg two. The neutral and the ground, the white and the green wire, they're actually both grounds. They connect right here to the frame. So that is interesting. Usually the neutral, which is the white wire, is the center tap between leg one and leg two. And there are two other wires right here that come from the stator that are connected to the frame. So I'm thinking these are actually the neutrals for leg one and leg two. And then the neutral gets picked up and brought over to the outlets from the frame. And then of course we have the bond for the ground. So that is a unique setup. Usually I would see this on a terminal block that's isolated the neutral coming out of the stator, leg one and leg two, with the neutral wire connected to that. And then if it's floating, then that would remain isolated. And if it's bonded, there'd be a jumper from the isolated neutral of the stator to the body. And yeah, this one's kind of weird. So, you know, I would say there's a possibility we just have some corrosion here and we're getting a bad neutral connection based on what I'm seeing. Of course, the fact that the capacitor blue tells me otherwise. You know, I think we must have an insulation failure. So let's isolate leg one and leg two by removing this nut right here. We'll do the same test as we did before, except this time we'll actually be on the proper wires. So let's see here. I've got a jumper on one of the neutrals. I'm not sure if it's leg one or leg two. We'll just connect this over here. And this wire is gonna introduce some resistance for sure. I think it'll be okay though. We're just trying to figure out where the fault is. So let's just check it to this leg and we get a connection, 0.3 ohms. 
a little low, but not terrible. And we should get no connection there because we're only connected to one of the neutrals coming out of the stator. And let's just check it to engine ground. Now that we're isolated, no fault. And let's just check it to the excitation. So that leg appears to be okay. Let me move the alligator clip over to the other. It's been moved over, so we should get no connection there, and we don't. And here we should get around 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Which we're close. It is a little higher, so this one is suspicious. Let's check it to engine ground. No connection, and check it to the excitation winding. No connection. So at least so far, this low voltage test is looking pretty good. Yeah, I'm not seeing any connections where there shouldn't be. So that is interesting. Might have to break out the high voltage tester. All right, let's give this a quick test. I've got the high voltage tester out. One lead is connected to ground. This green wire, which runs over here and is attached to the stator. The other lead on the high voltage tester is connected to the stator body. And like this, it should be a dead short. So I just wanna double check that everything is what I think it is, meaning if I, set this to 500 volts and turn this handle, the needle should go right to zero, which is all the way to the right. And you can see that's where it is. So that is a dead short. So let's move that lead off of the stator body and we'll connect it to leg one. Now I've actually connected leg one and leg two down on the stator. So this is testing both of them to ground. And ideally we want to see a connection 10 million ohms or less all the way over here. We're looking at, you know, 500 million ohms to infinite. And at 500 volts, we are basically infinite. So the insulation seems to be good. Let's check it at a thousand, thousand volts. And we have good insulation quality. So, no issue between leg one and leg two to ground. So let's move that over to the DPE winding. We'll test that to ground at 500 volts. And we have good insulation over 500 million ohms. So that is good. Now at 1,000 volts, same thing. So it seems like things are looking pretty good. I don't see any fault between leg one and leg two to ground or the excitation winding. So let's now check from the excitation winding to leg one and leg two. So we'll get this off of ground, move it over here. And I have leg one and leg two commoned up back in the power head again. So we are testing both leg one and leg two to the excitation. And we have very good insulation between them. We'll try it at a thousand volts. And same thing. So that's a good sign. I'm not seeing a short or bad insulation between any of the windings and ground and between the excitation winding and leg one and leg two. I guess the last test I can do is check between leg one and leg two. So I'm gonna double check that by removing this jumper. We'll separate those. So leg one and leg two, they are now isolated. And we'll move some stuff around here. So right now we do have one lead on leg one, put the other one on leg two. 
and we'll check it at 500 volts. Insulation seems good. And now at a thousand. And it's not quite as good. It's a little erratic, especially when I just start turning this. It goes down to about 10 million ohms, which is a little suspicious. And it's fluctuating quite a bit. Just try it a little faster here. Yeah, so that, that's a little suspicious, the way this is acting. So potentially there's an issue between leg one and leg two. I don't think that would explain necessarily why it would blow out the capacitor. I did double check it and yeah, it's open. So that new capacitor is toast. So I would say this is inconclusive at best. You know, I do have another high voltage tester. It can go higher than a thousand volts. So I say we break that one out. So let's do the same tests. I'm going to set this to 2,500 volts, which is way more than I should need to worry about on a 240 volt generator. I've got one lead connected here to the excitation winding. And I'm going to hold the other one just on the stator housing and we'll test it. So we're already at eight giga ohms and climbing. So no issues there. Let's see, I have leg one and leg two isolated from each other. So we'll check each one individually. We're at around four giga ohms, no issues there. Check the other leg. And we're at about 10 giga ohm in climbing. So no faults to ground from anything. So let's check from this leg to the excitation winding. And this is where it gets a little sketchy because there's no clip here. So we'll try not to t touch this at 2,500 volts. And we're at 18 giga ohm, no issues there. Let's check between leg one and leg two, maybe. And we're at about two giga ohms, no issues there. And let's see what else, I guess we can test from the other leg. to the excitation winding. And we get a short. Or I didn't hit the button. 12 giga ohm and climbing. So yeah, I don't think we're dealing with an insulation failure. You know, maybe I got a bad capacitor and it failed in exactly the same way as the other one, which I would find hard to believe. So let me give this one some thought and yeah, I'll get back to you. It's the next day and I did some research. I was able to locate a service manual for this generator. And for the most part, the testing we did, that we just did, agrees with what that manual says. That manual also has a chart of the good resistance values for all the windings. And for the most part, it seems to agree with the results we got. Granted, this meter is not very accurate for super low ohms tests. 
And this manual actually lists the resistance to three decimal spots, which this cheap meter cannot do. So I do want to get a more precise reading. Uh, before I do that, though, I can do a quick and dirty test on the rotor. The problem with brushless rotors is that there are diodes in circuit and there's no slip rings. To get a really good test, you have to actually remove the stator, desolder the diodes, get them out of circuit, and then do some tests. Uh, but for now, if we just test on each diode on the solder connection facing the rotor, we should get about 0.5 ohms. Yeah, it looks like we're about there. We're at 0 0.6, 0 0.7. You subtract the 0 0.1 that's built into these leads, and we're right around 0.5 ohms. So, yeah, no smoking gun there either. Now, we are really running out of options here because the only two things you can service on a brushless generator are the capacitor and the diodes. And the diodes are really a last resort. According to the service manual, these diodes were overbuilt for this machine and they should not fail according to the manufacturer but anything is possible for this last test i'm just going to use this constant current capable power supply right now i've got it set to output exactly one amp and we'll just double check that with the meter and i hooked it up backwards but you can see we're at 1.00 two amps DC. So what we can do with that is connect it to a winding. And that's going to put one amp of power in. And then we can just measure the voltage. And from there, we can get the exact resistance. If the excitation winding, we're at 1.196 volts. And because I'm using an amp, it makes the conversion real easy. We're at 1.195 ohms. And that actually is a little bit off, according to the service manual. According to the service manual, the minimum value is 1.218. And we're at 1.1. 96. So if I were to believe what I'm reading in that manual, that means the excitation winding is junk. So let's let's double check another winding here. We'll check leg one. We're at 0.166 volts, and that translates roughly into 0.166 ohms. And according to the manual, the minimum is 0.169. So we're really close. We're at 0.003 off. I would say that is close enough for this equipment. So let's test the other leg. And we're pretty much the same for the other leg, 0.166. So that one is 0.002 under. And I would say that is close enough in my book. So really the only thing that's off here is the excitation winding. It's not a lot off. According to the manual, though, if it's below the minimum, then replace the stator. There's a problem with the stator. So, yeah, that's what I'm leaning towards at this point. You know, I do have another capacitor. It's not the 50 microfarad. It's 35. You know, I'm tempted just to throw it in just on the off chance I had a bad capacitor. Granted, the rating's wrong, 
so the generator will not get up to full power. But it would be interesting to see if it blows like the other one. So I'm gonna pause it here. I'm gonna reconnect the control panel. I'll put another capacitor in there and we'll try it one more time. All right, everything's put back together. I've got a new capacitor installed. It's 35 microfarad. It's underrated. Assuming it doesn't blow right away, we should get power. We're not gonna get full power, but it should be enough to light that light bulb with any luck. And I've also got the multimeters hooked up to measure voltage as well as the kilowatt. Who would have guessed? I half expected this to go up in flames. It didn't though, it powered right up. We were at 94 volts. I put a 1500 watt load on it and nothing blew out. So yeah, a $9 Amazon dual run capacitor that's meant for an HVAC system, has the wrong microfarad rating, ran this machine just fine. So I would say we got a dud. You know, this one I think I got from eBay. The seller said it was brand new. And when I tested it, it was on the very low end of passable. So I would say this may have been new old stock, most likely sitting on a shelf for a very long time. And it just wasn't up to the task. So let me pause it here. I'm gonna order another capacitor from a different seller at 50 microfarad, and we'll give that a try. So I just ordered another new capacitor, different brand. Hopefully we'll have better luck with that. It'll be here tomorrow. So while waiting for that, I just wanna finish up the engine. I did get a couple parts for it. One of them being this new pre-filter. So we'll get that installed. And although not absolutely necessary, I did get a new gasket for the carb body. The Nikki carbs, they are very sensitive to this gasket. It has to be perfect because it actually forms a bunch of passages where the fuel moves through. And if it's not making a good seal, you're gonna have issues at some point with that carb. So I'm just gonna pop the top of the carb off again. We'll put the new gasket in and just put this whole thing back together. Yeah, not in the best shape. And you can see these are some of the passages here I was talking about. So that seal really needs to be good. Also, I didn't remember this one being as bad as it was. You know, this is not a critical gasket. I could get away with reusing this. But I think I'm gonna peel it off and we'll just make up a new one.
That should be good enough. Doesn't have to be perfect on this side. If you do want it perfect, it's really the same process, but do it on a piece of glass or like a, a stone, like a piece of granite. That'll make a nice flat surface. Anyway, all we need to do now is get a piece of gasket material, cut out a hole that's this diameter, and then add these holes in the right spot. So I've already double checked the diameter here. We're at about 27 millimeters. And the punch set I have has one that's at 28. So that should be fine. A little bit too big is not an issue. You just don't want it too small or you're gonna restrict the flow. Almost. So close. Yeah, that should be good. That's the easy part. I think the harder part is locating the holes in the right spot. And the way I do it is just with a piece of paper, take a crayon, kind of rub it on there and then you can see exactly where the holes need to be and then I'll put that paper on here and punch them out. All right, so you can see the image there. And there is our template. So let's just punch the center out like that. Pretty close. Not sure what happened there, but there's plenty of material left to just elongate that a bit. The important thing is that it seals around this opening. Yeah, that should work.
Well, assuming the capacitor fixes this generator, it'll be really interesting to see what the power output looks like because this is advertised as a clean power generator. And according to the documentation, it does not produce more than 6% total harmonic distortion. And if that's true, that'll be the lowest of any generator, traditional generator that I've ever tested, never mind a brushless generator. So I think that's largely due to the fact that the stator is oversized. The wire is actually made out of copper instead of aluminum, like you see on a lot of newer generators. And we also have a V-twin engine. So there's gonna be a lot less ripple or cavitation with a single cylinder engine. It only fires once and then the flywheel actually has to rotate twice before you get a power stroke again. Whereas this one, every revolution you get a power stroke. So that theoretically in itself should make cleaner power. One more thing worthy of note, this has a huge plastic tank. A lot of people like plastic tanks because they don't rust. You know, that said, they do have a few downsides. Uh, they can melt if they're too close to the engine or the exhaust. And this company has taken a lot of time or given some thought as to where they place the tanks. They put it far away from the engine. And the other big failure point is this bushing right here. They usually fail after about 10 or 15 years. And these are almost always located on the bottom of the tank. So when they fail, the fuel leaks out, potentially burning your generator to the ground, and at the very least, making a huge mess. And with it like this, even if this fails, nothing is gonna leak out. I guess the only trade-off is you need a fuel pump to get it out of the tank. But these, they are cheap. You know, I think it's something that really all plastic tank generators should have. Anyway, there's really not much more to do. I don't have the capacitor yet. I think the one thing I do want to tackle is this right here. It kind of bugs me. This is such a nice machine. It really needs a fuel valve right there. And this filter, it's about five years old. So we'll get that swapped out as well. Let's see if I can do this without making a huge mess here. The new capacitor showed up today. This one was dirt cheap on Amazon. You know, that said, the reviews were pretty good. So I'm optimistic that this is gonna solve our problem. You know, hopefully it will do better than the original replacement. So yeah, let's get this installed and try it out.
So I get the same setup as last time. We get the light plugged in and turned on and the kilowatt on standby. Now the hope is we get 120 volts or more out of the 120. And the voltmeter here last time only made it about halfway. I'd say about 180 volts on the 240 output. So this time I'm looking for something closer to 240. Not too bad. Without a load, we're at 114 volts, 61 hertz. I put a light 1500 watt load on it, and the voltage actually came up closer to 120 volts, and the engine held at about 60 and a half hertz. So things are looking pretty good. As far as the 240 output goes, according to the meter, we were in the green almost exactly on 240. So yeah, I think this generator is a survivor. So I want to finish it up. We'll just get the cover on. I want to bring it outside. We'll do some more extensive load testing. I'm going to try to bring it up to the max. And I also want to take a look at the sine wave, see what it looks like, and also measure the harmonic distortion. I think I'm pretty much ready to go. I've got 9,000 watts of load on standby. Five space heaters and a heat gun on the end. You know, I have it balanced, so half is on leg one and the other half on leg two. So the plan is we'll get the engine started, we'll let it warm up with a 3,000 watt load, and then we'll double it to 6,000 watts and finally try bringing it up to 9,000 watts. And each step of the way, we'll double check the output, the volts, the hertz, the harmonic distortion and take a look at the sine wave.
I've got to say, I did not believe the manufacturer's claim of 7% total harmonic distortion. And not only was it not 7%, it was less than 7%. It never even got close to that. Without a load, we started at 4.7% harmonic distortion. And under a full 9,000 watt load, it only came up to 5.7% harmonic distortion. And that is the best hands down of any non-inverter generator I have ever tested. You know, as far as the engine goes, it had no issues. It started at 61.3 hertz, and under a full load, it was holding just fine at 57.7 hertz. And the voltage, no issues to report either. It started at 117 volts at a moderate load. It actually came up to close to 123 volts, and then under a full load, it was holding just fine at 116 volts. So I was ready to shut this thing down and call it done. Unfortunately, once the engine stopped, I could hear I had another problem. The starter motor never disengaged. It was spinning the entire time. You know, I tried clicking the ignition switch a few times to get it to shut off and that did not happen. So I ended up pulling the wire to get it shut down. Yeah, hopefully I didn't damage anything permanently. So I'm going to actually tap the wire to the battery, see if the starter motor gear still engages the ring gear and see if the starter solenoid is still stuck. Beautiful. Thankfully the engine still turns so I think we're okay as far as the ring gear and the starter gear. The key's off though. You know, this is the run position and this is the start. So it should only be pulling current on the starter when you turn this to start. So either the switch is bad or the starter solenoid and my money would be on the starter solenoid. So let's get this inside. We'll test this and uh, figure out where the problem is. So we got a few wires here. This one, actually goes to the starter solenoid and it is loose, which isn't a good thing, but that is not our problem. So I'm gonna disconnect that wire and probably this wire too. That's the feed from the battery. And what I wanna do is test for continuity between these two posts because the way this works is that there's an electromagnet in here. And when it's energized by the ignition switch, through this wire, it sends a plunger up and connects these two contacts together. And when you let go, the coil de-energizes and that contact should return to the bottom and break the connection between these two posts. So one or two things are going on here. Either the magnet is not de-energizing and we have a constant current holding the contacts closed, or maybe it's just stuck at the top, or maybe the contacts welded themselves and it's just holding it on the top. So I wanna get that wire off too, if possible, and that is also loose. This wire is most likely to charge the battery because this feeds over to the battery it also might send power to the switch, which then sends it back down here when you turn the switch on. So we are completely isolated. I've got the multimeter set just to make a tone when there's a connection. And there should be no connection between these posts. And there is. So this solenoid is bad. You know, potentially I could jar it free if I try to energize the coil and de-energize it a few times. 
but I don't think it's worth the chance. We could have done a lot of damage here, and if this is sticking, it needs to be replaced. So let's see. I think to get it off, it's just this bolt, and there's another one right on the top, and that should come right out of there. <laughs> ah, dropping it on the ground freed it up but yeah we'll get a new one just out of curiosity I'm going to double check these wires and I believe this one runs power up to the switch and the yellow one should bring it back down when I hit start so I'm going to do that now and if it's making a connection we should hear that meter beep and we do. So we know the switch is fine, these wires are fine, and we kind of already knew that based on the tests we just did, proving that this, for some reason, was stuck closed. Anyway, let's get a new one of these, and we'll finish it up. So to erase any doubt, I'm just gonna test this real quick. I've got the multimeter connected to each post, and this is set to measure ohms and make an audible beep when a connection is made. I have the ground connected to the battery negative and the positive will touch to the battery positive. And when we energize the coil, we should get a connection. And we have one, it's a little bit high, 30 ohms. That's a good connection. We have an open, even though it's energized still open not a great connection around 36 ohms open good connection so yeah this has issues it needs to be replaced i guess while we're waiting let's open up this bad starter solenoid this is just four rivets holding it together so we'll open it up take a look see how it works and maybe see what the problem is. like we're in interesting so we've got a spring I was expecting to see a little more than just this now, here we go So down here, this is the electromagnet. The positive is coming in right there. Let's see if we can see that wire. Yes, yeah, so the positive comes in right there. Looks like it's insulated. This one right here, I'm thinking, is the negative. And the negative wire is actually connected to this plate. So the spring actually must serve as the ground to the plate and puts negative on here, which goes into that wire. It looks like I need to clip that wire or potentially this will push through. I think we'll just clip the wire because I'm not gonna use this one again.
Let's see if that lifts out. There's not much to it. When this coil of wire has current running through it, it pushes this piece of metal up. And when it does that, it pushes on this piece of plastic right here. You can hear it clicking. So there's a set of contacts under here, which bridge these two posts. Let's see if this will come out. Yep, and I just lost a piece. Let me grab it. I found one of the parts that flew out, and this is the one that does all the work. This is just a copper bar, and it gets pushed up by the electromagnet. So when this is energized, it sends this piece of metal up, pushes against the plastic, which in turn pushes this copper bar up. And that is going to complete a circuit because on here you have two terminals. One goes to the battery, that's battery positive. The other one goes to the starter. So when these are bridged, the current can flow to the starter. And that happens when this bus bar gets pushed up and it makes contact with both those terminals. Now the failure, I think in this case, has to do with the high resistance. It most likely caused a lot of heat, and you can see there's a mark right there. And if you look on the underside of these terminals, you can see the one on the left doesn't look too good. It's a little crispy. So this bus bar most likely welded itself lightly to the bar on the left, and that's why it wouldn't shut off when the coil was de-energized. So technically, this could be reused if you wanted to clean it up and put it back together. You know, in my case, the replacement part was available and it was only, I think, $25. So that should be here in a few days. So when it shows up, we'll test it and get it on the machine. Huh. Let's carefully have a little fun. I'm going to try to energize this without creating a short. Let's see if this thing launches into space. Nope. expecting more about a quarter inch of travel and that's it cool all right the new starter solenoids showed up today so i'm going to test this just to make sure it's good as we found out earlier with the capacitor new does not always mean good so we'll do the same test and when I energize it, we should see a reading, ideally, at around one or two ohms. Now, the other solenoid we were getting open quite a bit when tapping this. So let's see what this one does. Point 0.6 is good. Point 0.6. Point 0.6. Point 0.6 and 0.6 so yeah this one i think it's good got this wire here. This is a ground wire. It should be connected right there.
It's kind of funny that this one has the boot. That one's always energized. This one almost never has power, yet this is the one that's protected. Kind of odd. See if it still cranks. Beautiful. Well guys, that's pretty much a wrap. You know, this was supposed to be an easy fix. Usually when brushless generators stop making power, it's due to a bad capacitor. And that's exactly what I found. So I thought this was a slam dunk, put a new capacitor in and it should make power. And of course, that didn't happen. The new capacitor blew out. So that sent me chasing my tail. You know, I tested that stator very thoroughly using several different meters, and I couldn't find a problem. Not only that, the quality of the insulation on this machine is better than pretty much every machine I've ever tested. So yeah, that is saying something about the build quality here. That and the fact that the THD is so low you know, people are always asking me for names of non-inverter generators that make clean power. And my answer is there are none, at least not portable generators. And this one, it's pretty clean. I mean, 5.7% under a full load, that's, that's good. So if you're looking for clean power and you don't want an inverter, consider something like this. Now, these aren't cheap either. Brand new, something like this is over $2,000. And they make larger models. I took a quick look. I saw they had a 15,000 watt model. And this company, it is still in business. I actually called them at one point. I wanted to question them about what could blow that capacitor. And surprisingly, someone answered the phone right away, an actual person. I asked to speak to someone technical and they transferred me within 10 seconds to that technical person and they actually knew what they were talking about. So yeah, pretty impressive. Anyway, I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching.